old-fashioned murder and mayhem, The Bad Seed, Jimmy M. Brock. It was the weekend before Thanksgiving, 1934, and preparations were already being made in homes across America for the annual celebration. Early Saturday morning, November 24th, a worker with the Waterworks Department in Osaka, Mississippi, was sent to the reservoir to check on the partially submerged tank. The opening to the reservoir jutted above the ground and was locked as usual. However, the employee noticed the ground had been disturbed and blood was pooled in various places on and around the tank. Following the trail left in the grass, he was horrified to discover the badly mutilated body of a man sprawled on the ground not far from the tank. His skull was crushed and his face and throat had been slit. Cigarette ashes were dropped on his bloodied face, indicating the murderer had been smoking as he stood over the victim. Suddenly terrified, the employee fled from the scene to report the grisly discovery. Welcome to another episode of Old Fashioned Murder and Mayhem. I am your host, Mindy Hudson, bringing you stories of true crime and scandal with a twist of genealogy. This month's story is The Bad Seed, Jimmy M. Brock. Oftentimes, the family tree in rural southern towns more closely resembles a vine, with its branches twisting back and forth among the few surnames who reside in the vicinity. The ties that knit these families together can be very strong and sometimes very deadly. Such was the case of the 1934 murder of James Jimmy Miller, born in 1893, who married Ivy Bell Morris, daughter of Almond Melton Morris and Susie Self. The Miller family made their home in Mount Hermon, Louisiana, which is located on the toe of the boot-shaped state in Washington Parish, straddling the Louisiana-Mississippi border. Miller was a farmer supporting a wife and six children. Ivy Bell's first cousin, Mabel Morris, was the daughter of Ivy's uncle, James Alex Morris, with his second wife, Evie Barker. In January 1930, Mabel married James Monroe, Jimmy Brock, one of nine children born to William Boyd Brock and Beulah Dean Fortenberry. Just like most of the residents in the communities of 1930s rural Louisiana and Mississippi, Jimmy Brock also made his living tending a small farm. The alarm concerning the bludgeoned body found near the Osaka, Mississippi Reservoir spread like wildfire throughout the small towns along the Mississippi and Louisiana border. Osaka is located about 10 miles northwest of Mount Hermon. It didn't take long before an identification was made. The murdered man was 41-year-old Jimmy Miller. Ivy Bell Miller confirmed that her husband had left the previous evening with her cousin's husband, Jimmy Brock, and another friend, J.O. Brab Alford, and the trio had been drinking heavily. What's more, Mrs. Miller claimed her husband had a large amount of money with him, over $500, which was missing when his body was discovered. In addition, the blood smeared on the reservoir tank made it apparent the assailant had planned to toss the dead body into the tank, but was thankfully unsuccessful due to the sturdy lock which held it shut. Jimmy Brock and Brab Alford were brought into the Pike County, Mississippi, police station. When questioned, Brock admitted that he and Miller had been drinking with Alford the previous evening. Fueled by the alcohol, Brock and Miller got into a heated argument. Brock claimed Miller came at him brandishing a car jack, but he wrestled it away and struck Miller with it. The bloodied weapon was found at the scene. Brock panicked and tried to dispose of the body in the reservoir, but found it locked tight. 
He then slashed Miller's neck with a knife, almost decapitating him to be sure he was dead and fled the area. He cleared Alford of being involved, stating that Alford had passed out in the automobile before the altercation took place. Brock first denied that he had stolen the money from Miller, but by Thanksgiving, the $500 had been uncovered, hidden in a can in Brock's horse stall. Upon hearing that the money had been recovered, Brock unlaced his shoes and attempted to hang himself in the jail cell. Nevertheless, other prisoners caught the attention of the guards, and they were able to stop the desperate man. The money was returned to Mrs. Miller, who was in dire need of it. It was rumored that Brock was planning to claim that the two men got into a row because Brock had paid for the liquor and Miller refused to repay him. He claimed Miller attacked him first, but the brutality of the murder caused his lawyers to decide to go with an insanity defense. By December 1934, details began to emerge about both Miller and Brock that were expected to make it into the trial. Jim Brock had been committed to an insane asylum in 1928. However, it was pointed out that his stay had lasted only 45 days. It was also pointed out that Jim Miller had been arrested three times on liquor violations in Mount Hermon and that Miller had blamed Brock for aiding in his arrest. According to Brock's defense lawyers, this was the true catalyst that started the fatal fight. The trial was set for April 1935 in Pike County, Mississippi. Brock's attorneys were F.D. Hewitt of Macomb, Mississippi, and O.W. Phillips of Magnolia, Mississippi. The prosecution was represented by District Attorney James W. Cassidy and County Attorney J. Gordon Roach. The case went to the jury late Saturday, April 6th, as storms were raging through the area. After the summations, the jury retired to deliberate. The lights began flickering, and suddenly everything went pitch dark. There was the panic sound of chairs scraping against the floor and people scrambling. Someone shouted, Don't let the prisoner escape! To which the reassuring voice of Mabel Brock responded, He's all right. He's right here. When the light suddenly snapped back on, she was sitting behind him, with her arm wrapped around his neck, and Brock was seated calmly. It didn't take long for the jury to return with a verdict, manslaughter. Brock received a 20-year sentence at Mississippi Hospital for the Insane in Whitfield, Mississippi. He was there only a few months when on December 10th, he managed to escape. He was caught in Copiah County and returned to the asylum, but he escaped again on Christmas Day, 1935. This time, he laid low for a couple of months. In February 1936, witnesses reported seeing him in Tylertown, Walthall County, Mississippi. His wife was questioned, and she admitted she had seen him and that he was well. His luck ran out at the end of February when he was recaptured in Walter County. This time, he was sent to Mississippi State Penitentiary in Parchman, Sunflower County, Mississippi, to serve out his sentence. Mabel Brock moved to Bogalusa, Washington Parish, Louisiana, along with her three daughters, to live with her recently widowed mother, Evie Morris. In 1937, Mabel filed for divorce from Jim Brock. He was furious with her and threatened to kill her and anyone she married. She went through with the divorce anyway. Nevertheless, Mabel did not remarry until after 1942, when she wed J. H. Walker, a widower over 20 years her senior. Brock's anger appeared to cool when he was released from Parchman on parole in February 1945. He moved to New Orleans where he got a government job in a Navy yard. 
he made a few visits to the home of his ex-wife and her husband, where he visited with his daughters and seemed to get along peacefully with the arrangement. However, the bad seed that stirred within him was still rotting away inside. In July 1945, Brock made a visit to Macomb, Mississippi, and visited the Hartman Funeral Home there. He paid on a burial policy and made an ominous remark to the director as he showed him a tattoo on his arm. He said, quote, Look at this tattoo so you will be able to remember me. End quote. On July 9th, Brock again went to Bogalusa, claiming he needed to get his birth certificate for his job at the Naval Yard. Mabel and her husband allowed him to spend the night at their home. The middle daughter, age 11, had gone to New Orleans to visit Brock's sister and was not at home. During the night, Brock began trying to convince Mabel to divorce her husband and return to him. She refused and went to bed. The two other daughters, ages 14 and 7, had also gone to bed, as well as Mabel's mother, Evie, 63. Apparently, Mabel told Walker about her ex-husband's harassment. He returned to the living room where he and Brock argued. About that time, the eldest daughter got out of bed to see what was going on. Brock grabbed her by the throat and began choking her. Hearing the commotion, Grandmother Evie Morris entered the room and tried to break up the fight. Brock produced a twenty-five automatic pistol and fired twice at her, hitting her in the stomach and neck. As she fell, she pleaded with Jimmy. Why? Brock next went into his ex-wife's bedroom. There was a struggle, but he was able to shoot her twice, killing her. She was thirty-six. Completely hysterical, both children fled the house. Walker also got out and ran toward his brother-in-law's home, which was a short distance away. He never made it. Brock followed him and shot him in the garden. When the police arrived, the Brock children were too upset to convey what had happened. It was late at night as the authorities arrived at the gruesome site and tried to make sense of what had gone on. The little house was filled with signs of struggle, blood, and bodies. Walker's body lay nearby in the vegetable garden. Jimmy Brock had run into a cornfield, and when the police began closing in, they heard gunshots. Thinking he was firing at them, they decided to wait until the sun came up to flush him out. However, Brock had shot himself twice in the chest and succumbed to the wounds. The July 13, 1945 edition of Bogalusa Enterprise in American newspapers cited that between seven to 800 people attended the funerals of the slain family. A joint funeral for Mabel Walker and her mother Evie Morris was held at the Mount Hermon Baptist Church. The interment was in the church cemetery. Mr. Walker's funeral was held at Mount Olive Baptist Church near Bogachito, Mississippi. Family members of Jim Brock quietly claimed his body and took him away, but the notoriety of his life drew a large crowd. The funeral was held at Silver Springs Baptist Church in Pike County, Mississippi. Of the nine children born to Boyd and Beulah Dean Brock, Jimmy was the only one who caused so much grief. One newspaper even claimed that the 1923 death of Boyd Brock was due to a blow on the head by a hammer in the hands of his son, Jimmy. However, no proof has been found to substantiate this claim. Following the tragedy, the Brock girls were raised by foster parents, George and Estelle Long. As for the widow of Jim Miller, Ivy Bell Morris married Henry Davis, who helped raise her children. In April 1954, Henry was working in the field and died of a heart attack. Having experienced so much tragedy in her young life, Ivy died of self-inflicted wounds three months later. She was 54. 
Thank you for listening to this episode of The Bad Seed, Jimmy M. Brock. Please be sure to like, subscribe, and comment. See the description box for more information about the resources used. Join me again on the first of next month for another episode of Old Fashioned Murder and Mayhem.